So I'm Louisa Wood Ruby. Um, I'm head of research here at the Frick Art Reference Library, and I'm happy today to welcome Misha Kubal, conceptual artist, um, as part of our interview series for the Center of the History of Collecting, Collecting the Uncollectible Earth and Site Specific Sculpture. Misha Kubal, conceptual artist, has been working in the public and institutional sphere since 1977. He uses light as a medium to explore architectural spaces as well as social and political discourses and reflects on a whole variety of aspects from sociocultural structures to architectural interventions, as well as emphasizing or reinterpreting their monumental nature and context in architectural history. Since 2007, Misha Kubal has been a professor for public art at the Academy of Media Arts, Cologne, an associate professor for media art at Hochschule für Gestaltung, ZKM, Karlsruhe. Since 2015, he has been a member of the North Rhine-Westphalian Academy of Sciences, Humanities, and the Arts, Dusseldorf. In 2016, he was honored with the German Light Award. So welcome once more. Um, the first question is, when were you born and where? The place where I was born is Dusseldorf, and this is also the current home and uh, studio place. But I'm traveling a lot, so it's good to have a Yeah, I don't home think you're home. in Dusseldorf that often, even though <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it's your home true. base. <laughs> yeah, I was born in 1959. I remember that was a very good design of a Cadillac in the U.S. You mentioned that you started out as a psychologist, which I found very interesting. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of your career? Yes, I was, um, um, I was quite young. Um, I was almost uh, 21 when I f uh, first... Um, um, was father of Timo. He was born in 1980, and uh, I had to make a very quick decision. I was practicing actually as an artist in public space, very much a performative, a little bit of a theater uh, career or experience as well. And then suddenly I was in the single parent uh, situation, and I decided um, to jump on a train which I found in that particular moment interesting, and that was psychology. It also came along with media pedagogic, so it was the idea how to treat uh, young born between zero and three years old uh, in terms of uh, new media. And at that time, new media, there was photography, moving image, video, and I found it quite impressive. And uh, this study may have helped me to develop the practice I'm doing for more than 40 years now. There is an element of psychology, or a, a large element of psychology, in your in your interventions, as you like to call them. Can you discuss the word intervention to sort of explain to the audience what you mean by that? I think intervention is a kind of an amalgam or kind of a catalyst between spaces and people who are using the space. I'm not interested in architecture as such. I'm interested in the use of architecture and function and the notion of movement and creating situations and moments. And that became more and more, to me, a value by itself. Um, we will later on a um, little bit get more into the question how one can collect these kind of experiences. But for me, it was, first of all, to create. It was not about to document. It was not about uh, the selling factor. But it was about uh, making things happen in public space, in public sphere. And it was taking, actually, almost all risks to do that. I mean, I was kind of expanding, let's say, the laws of the German uh, government on, on some as aspects. For instance, I was creating demonstrations as an artist and professor. And I was working with students. At the same time, I was an antipode in the society. How you can mix these kind of functions, and I'm interested to move on. And that's still one of these most um, vivid ingredients of my daily practice. So would you say the impetus for the works is a political one, essentially, or just sometimes, or is, is there some kind of mix? It's very hard to say, but how can you, for instance, do a light installation in, inside a synagogue without being political, without touching very social, um, loaded uh, components? And uh, you, are you are absolutely current in, in, in this debate. I've done this in 94 when I was working in the synagogue in... Uh, Stommel, which is a very small town near Cologne. This was the only remaining synagogue after the Nazi uh, pogrom in 1938. And that was only the reason uh, because the, if the farmer has been using this synagogue as a kind of a cabin for his machines, for the agriculture, rather than it was, you know, it was uh, saved by the people. So after renovating the space, the question was how one could generate a discourse about memory, how we can behave or what is our relation to this part of the dark 12 years. Just 12 years was called the Third Reich. It was talking about 1,000 years. So it was all about this 
this uh, a very um, sick expectations to the society. So to touch and create a project, Refraction House, inside the synagogue was very political. It was very brave by the people surrounding this small synagogue because they were exposed through the lights to the public in the middle of a very anti-Semitic and anti um, it was a very xenophobic moment in time of the German uh, population. That was 94? That was 94. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of assassination at that time. There were uh, asylum homes had been set on fire in 92. There was a lot of attacks against um, not only Jewish, but also Jewish and uh, Turkish uh, communities. So in this moment, to create a piece which even more highlight this aspects of uh, segregation and uh, kind of a weak uh, social standard in the society. You know, that was, that was the artwork. How did they find you? How did you find them? Why did they, how did that come about? Um, I think what, what, uh, what one has to see is the history of this particular project. It was called Project Synagogue Stommel and it was dealing with one artist for maybe six or eight weeks exposure a year. So mm -hmm. there's a highly concentration mm -hmm. and expectation on that particular single artist you have okay. been chosen on. Mm -hmm. First one was Yanis Kunelis. Mm -hmm. He was teaching at that time at the Dusseldorf Academy as a professor for public, uh, sorry, for sculpture. And then the second artist was the American artist Richard Serra. Mm -hmm. And he was revealing so this project and saying to public that he was asked by his mother not to tell in the street that he's from a Jewish family. I found this very surprising uh, that we're talking about the 1940s uh, in the US. And I didn't know about this anti-Semitic uh, movement in that time. And the third artist was the German artist Georg Baselitz, who was kind of denying the aspects of the former synagogue and was talking about the renomé reputation of that space through the famous artist has been named before him. And that's maybe I initiated, you know, I was not invited for this project. I initiated That's what I was that. wondering. Did they invite you? Or, no. Yeah. I, w I was pretty too young. On that list, you would continue with Bruce Nauman and Richard Long and all these artists. But then, oh, and they did, most of them. They were involved and it was um, older than uh, 65 by the time being. But um, I was uh, writing a letter to the organizers and said, let's lock the synagogue and do something from inside to the outside and connect the society mm -hmm. to the synagogue and don't make it an art place like a white cubish uh, gallery mm -hmm. space. And it's not so much about programming, it's so much about discourse and irritation. Mm -hmm. And they followed that path. Mm -hmm. And um, we're still together. We work together still today. That, that group? In yes, that group, they were initiating it. It's Angelika Schallenberg. Now it's just one person. Mm -hmm. She's maintaining it. The other person passed away, unfortunately, in 2001. I'm a little bit of a consultant, and there's the next artist is the U.S. and New York-based artist Alfredo Jar, who is taking the mission on in September this year. Do you feel that you mean to help or change people in any way through your art, both individually and collectively? Well, as I encounter and enhance uh, people to participate, I mean, there's a lot of discourse around participation. I mean, it starts from contribution to kind of um, exploitation sometimes. If you ask people to volunteer and do something and then you expose it as your artwork. So there's a lot of things and uh, discussions coming alongside with that. My art practice did, from the very beginning, involve people. I, I was always interested in to encourage the audience and to let the audience turn into actors. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was always fascinated by that and I failed many times doing that because, because audience, is, uh, audience create, is created by individuals and mm -hmm. it's easier to encourage one person mm -hmm. as a one person to person relationship. But if, if this turns out to be five people or even more, then it becomes a kind of group of people and then group dynamics start to work. And mm -hmm. one of these uh, group dynamics is to be phlegmatic. Mm -hmm. Don't move, don't, don't change. <laughs> and if it's all about changing in the movement, yeah. so you have to, to, to put a lot of effort to make it happen. And I started to work on this in 1998 for the Sao Paulo Biennale when it was on the, on the footprints uh, of uh, Wilhelm Flusser, a Czech philosopher who was escaping from the Nazi regime. He established a, uh, an institute of uh, Comunicologia in Sao Paulo. And when I was invited to represent Germany, I thought I'd do everything but not represent a country. But because it's, you know, we are living in post-colonial times, so there's a certain kind of awareness and s sensitivity to that subject matter. And I decided to encourage uh, 72 families to participate in a project where I was changing their lamp sources from the private domain with one I produced myself 
and take their lambs from their home and expose that to the public of the Biennale. And that was the German contribution. There was nothing from Germany, except that the artist was from Germany. And also, I take myself as a contributor and not as, you know, I'm, I'm the person, I know everything. I'm, you know, I'm just more the assistant to the process than, and a little bit of an initiator, but not, I'm not taking it the other way around. So maybe it's easier for me to uh, talk to people and to work with people because they accept me on eye level. You don't go in as sort of like the big director know-it-all yes. and I'd like you to do this and I'd like you to do that. You're more like trying to encourage interactions. And, and even ask people sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, like if it's about making decisions. I mean, it's easier. I think top down, maybe sometimes it sounds easier and it's quicker, as mm -hmm. we know, but bottom up maybe has more substantial and has more sustainability in a sense of that people stay connected. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of projects and even 22 years ago when I was working for Sao Paulo Biennale, I still have contact to most of the people. Mm -hmm. And we initiated a project um, as a family because that was the year when I got married first time with the twins. Um, then we, we decided to initiate an alphabet, uh, kind of an, a pedagogic program in a favela. So this is still on working. We have more than 5,600 people going through the program. 150 had finished university. So if this is part of an art project, I would be very interested to continue on that path because I think that's very important. And I'm going to work on this kind of level now for Los Angeles in in connection to the uh, Villa Aurora and the Thomas Mann House, which is German funded. But they are interested to um, initiate projects involving neighborhoods. And I'm interested to do that and work on a research right now and will continue in September this year. Well, I'm dying to ask you how this all gets started, but I was just going to continue mm -hmm. a little bit through um, just a little bit more about the way you manipulate light and your think, thinking about light and light for therapeutic purposes and your, the importance of shadow to your work. And if you could just talk a little bit about that before we get into the ownership and the collecting yeah. aspects of it. Well, I think light is a, is a very, let's say, um, a very easy media to me because I started to work with it um, and I used that in a space context. Uh, I was not so much interested in projecting, projecting like images, but I was using the light to connect indoor and outdoor and to become more a, like, let's say, a frame um, to create historical and present time connections. I practiced that with the Bauhaus in Dessau because the Bauhaus is a political uploaded and now it's celebrating 100th anniversary, but at the same time it is also um, has a very historical component. It was politically banned by the Nazi regime in 1933. So whatever you touch, the light touches the ground and the ground is not innocent by itself. It speaks and through the light, this communication between the historical um, embodiness, which I, it's a, it's a psychological term, this embodiness of the material, which is also the bodies we have, and the body of material around us, architecture, urban structure, maybe a tree. And these things through the light starts to speak. So this is a way of transmitting communication, establishing an awareness. It makes things so visible that you can't ignore them. There's also an element of light, you know, being treating everyone equally. There's yes. no discrimination. Light exactly. shines on every yeah. being in the same exactly. way. So For this Sao Paulo project, private light, public light, it was also ignoring, let's say, the differences in wealth and uh, um, education and etnia. So it was kind of, you know, it was leveling everyone up to the same right. visibility. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like um, the answer to my next question, do you have any outcomes in mind for your interventions or are you just interested in the process? It sounds like the latter, <laughs> that you just sort of set a situation up and then allow it to evolve. Is that correct? This is correct. And um, as I said, when I started, it was more about the performative aspect and this ephemeral um, moment that things can change from time to time. And we are just part of it and we have to be very sensitive to that notion. But then more and more I started to document it and ask people and involve people to do documentation. So publication and um, media presence uh, turn out to be also very important. Could one actually own a work by you? What does it mean to own a work by you? Because the works in a way don't exist. I mean, 
<laughs> they, they happen, they're events. Is it, it the documentation of the work or the record of the work or the video of the work or, or is that not really something that you think about? I think the first ownership is, um, is a commitment you make. Mm -hmm. I think the commitment is that, yes, I'm interested in this kind of process. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm interested in this kind of project. Mm -hmm. And then you may participate in this. Because all the people, for instance, in Brazil, they were owning the lambs afterwards. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, the ownership was they, they were participating. Mm -hmm. They were documented in a publication. They were visible and visited by more than 900,000 people for that very successful Biennale in that time, and they own a lamb. So, I mean, in total... <laughs> Everybody owns it in a way. <laughs> in a way, it's a collective, it's a collective ownership. And I think uh, through oral history and documentation, this ownership is increased by, by people, by numbers of people, also in the sense of that it is not about possession. I think possession and ownership, I would make a little bit of a difference here. I think possession would mean that it's a very private, I can do what I want to do with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that the laws maybe give some restrictions to that kind of, you cannot burn your, your money, for instance, because the money doesn't belong, it, it's, it, you own the value of the money, but not, uh, let's say, the, the currency itself. So um, here, it's a, it's a matter of um, abstract transformation. I think once you decided yourself and committed yourself to participate in that project, you made a commitment to be in an ephemeral, let's say, situational structure. Mm -hmm. And it's not the physical representation you're interested in, even though there is a print, there's a video, and there's a book. Mm -hmm. All these things exist, and people are buying it. Mm -hmm. But for me, this buying process is ownership involvement, and mm. this normally increased and involves more interest in the projects rather than mm -hmm. just, I have it. Yeah. This is the, 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 let's say this satisf uh, satisfaction of uh, having it is mm -hmm. very, very little to compare to the ownership. The ownership means that I keep track, I mm -hmm. want to follow, I want to see how these things develop mm -hmm. and grow into this mm -hmm. corner and maybe has to be rethought and moved to another corner. So you're also part of the failure, you're also part of the um, dis uh, disappointment if things are not working out as we may have proposed it. But um, nonetheless, let's say in the book that you kindly gave me, um, you have a piece, Geometric Light Form, shown on the like, Lichtenstein Palace from 1996. Yes. So the Lichtenstein Palace is, is illuminated, the inside, the interior, with geometric light forms. And it's listed as being owned by the Museum Moderne Kunststiftung Ludwig in yes. Cologne. So how does that institutional ownership of that work? They have the ownership. They, know, they have the equipment. They have documentation how it has been uh, established in 1996, and they always have the right to reinstall it. Some of the pieces are working like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe also the current one I'm doing for the for the Jewish Museum right now. So it's 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 ephemeral. It's installa It's an installation, right. and you you have an exact plan how it could be established. Even though the technology gets a little bit older, you know, right. looking from today, and you have to maintain. Uh, you have to put a lot of maintenance to make it still work. But if you keep this a, a, um, aside, you, you have the right to reinstall this, uh, this installation. And in could that they space. do it? Is, it? is it just in that space? Is the piece dependent on the Lichtenstein Palace? Or could we borrow it here at the Frick and do it in our Fragonard room or something? Yes, <laughs> if, if this would be an exhibition copy. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's also this you mentioned before in a different context. We were talking about the three mirror balls. This mm -hmm. is a traveling piece. And then it has to be installed by myself. The geometric light forms. Yes, because if it's leaving the space, if it's leaving the Lichtenstein, Lichtenstein Palace, Lichtenstein Palace in Vienna, then it would come to Frick. We can do it at Frick, but then we have to to make decisions on the side and the height of the projection and what comes into into light. What mm -hmm. what what will be mm -hmm. through that installation because it's rotating, it's movement, mm -hmm. and it would highlight maybe a carpet or a wallpaper or the um, the desk. Of you know in the in the in the, frick, uh, in, the in the collection or, or some of the art pieces and so we are touching different mm -hmm. topics mm -hmm. despite what what the work has been done in Vienna. Okay, but let's say what happens to that work in fifty years when you're not around to come install it here and we decide I'm, just for some reason that we want to show it here. Um, do you have are, are there uh, is there a legacy? Uh, how does the legacy work? How would 
how would they recreate that piece somewhere else? Or I guess in the Liechtenstein Palace, they could recreate yes. it because there's documentation, sure. but mm -hmm. someone, it would be a harder thing to have it be borrowed. I think something. it has to be also discussed with the estate then further mm -hmm. on and plus mm -hmm. uh, with the institution itself. Mm -hmm. So we know from some uh, institutions that site-specific pieces will not be on the loan list mm -hmm. for other institutions mm -hmm. to borrow. So. I think this is we are in this in between zone with this particular piece, but there are other pieces meant to be to travel, mm -hmm. and they always will find a site specific um, component. And I think that's can, with a little bit of a routine, people can judge and make decisions without me. Right. Yeah. How did these work in terms of commissions? Like, how did let's say these sort of more institutional based um, projects like the geometric light forms or or, or even not, the streetcar in um, Kotovitz or the, or the refraction lighthouse in Stommel and Synagogue. How, how, did, how did those, get, were they commissioned? Was it your idea you put forward to, to whom? How, how did these things you know, come about? How, did, how do you start a project? I think there is, this, there is this character that how an artist could or should work. I think um, I found it myself more as a limitation than an invitation. So the limitation is that you have to be asked, that you work in the studio, you prepare stuff, people come to visit you and then invite you to participate in a group show, a thematic show, right. or even do a solo project. And maybe I'm a little bit more interested in initiating. So I was not, I was not, I'm not this person asking too much for permission, I'm honest. <laughs> and, but I'm not, I mean, it's not that I'm interested in illegal uh, process, but, or being sued or being taken to, uh, to court, but, um, this can happen. I was a squatter. I was squattering buildings because for the political need to give people home without this, let's say, um, if they're in the poverty stage, you know, or students even though. And we were squattering buildings uh, as a political... In, Ber in Berlin? No, in Dusseldorf, in, Dusseldorf? in Berlin, okay. in some I know some they places. did that in Berlin. Oh, yeah, that was a, a the the nationwide. Wall. It was yeah. a nationwide. Okay. No, even before. Okay. I was doing that in the 80s, uh, yeah, late 70s. So I think it's... Everything you do it be, turns out to be a statement. And if this is true, then, um, for instance, the Katowice piece, it's, it's a very good example how fast um, one could work with the administration. St I mean, if you think about municipality, administration, bureaucracy, we all think this is all about time, especially time you waste mm -hmm. and you have to wait for. And um, we found in Katowice, this is a, a very coal mining based uh, city in south of Poland has a very vivid history and very strong and um, you know people are very shaken but they were also very aware about this situation and this is a city in transition and they had an unsuccessful application to become the cultural capital of Europe an unsuccessful process oh. but in the middle of this process they realized there's so much energy in the city and they wanted to incorporate this energy and brought artists from abroad to the city and work on projects. Okay, they're twenty invited. miles. They're the town that's twenty miles from Auschwitz. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when I came there first, I had this idea to use the streetcar, convert this into a white kind of light train, and find a driver, which was Olga, fifty by that year, uh, fifty years by that time, and she was doing a tour. She was unpredictable. She was not stopping. She was not function in the as a as a classical Actual tramway, bus driver. <laughs> just just passing by all stops. And people got furious, people got nervous, people were writing to the mayor, something is wrong, and uh, I saw my grandmother sitting there. And I, then we, 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 because my assistant, Claudia, she is from Poland, she could read, uh, she could read uh, these uh, notes, and then she said, okay, but this, I think it's about Auschwitz. Because they, they were projecting into this light train, which was transition, trend, I mean, driving through the city, was kind of a, became a vessel of imagination and uh, memories. So people were writing to the mayor about this experience and we were confronted with this experience even knowing that Auschwitz and uh, Auschwitz, which is the name of the city in Auschwitz, yeah. is the German name for the con two concentration camps, is so close that people have this strong association. And then coming as a German artist with a Slavic name, Misha Kubal as a, <laughs> as a Slavic uh, And non-Jewish also. <laughs> and non-Jewish. So there was this, maybe it was um, kind of offending to the people in a mm -hmm. way, but they, it turned out they didn't t they didn't uh, take it as an of, uh, offended matter from 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 the artist, but they or action from the artist, but they liked the idea that well, they disliked the first the dysfunctional part of it, but then turned out to be 
they started to to like the um, surprisement and the uh, irritation in the end. How long did this bus travel around for? The tram. It was a streetcar. Tram, street yeah, car. the streetcar so was. So it had a route it, that it had to take. Yeah, but it was not predictable. She Olga was deciding on herself. She and had they, access to every routes, connecting cities. But Katowice. didn't she like hit real tram cars? No, no, no. <laughs> she 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 knew where where to go. Okay. But <laughs> she was the only. She was she had the master plan. Okay. And she was starting on Thursday and then driving on Friday, mm -hmm. Saturday not, Sunday Monday, Tuesday not, Wednesday finish. So it was one week. Five days. Five days. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, yeah. but you know, I mean, it's just the idea that she. I mean, her driving sequence was just five days, but still, you can after five years, you can go to Katowice and ask people about it, and they still know. I think I believe in the presence of the absence. <laughs> yes, you laugh, but it, that's true because if something is always there, you don't have to mention. Oh, mm -hmm. But if you take these flowers away from, from, from the window, mm -hmm. the next person come in and say, where's this flower gone? Mm -hmm. Because the recognition is that we look after the, what, what's, what's the artifact, what, what, what is wrong in the picture? Right. And we have this idea of harmonious or um, kind of a setup or design setup. And if we take something out or add something, people will reckon. Mm -hmm. And my practice New Yorkers, is, the trade towers, so no one ever paid attention to them until they were gone. And now they, they were are, gone. you know, yeah. Now you still find postcards with mm -hmm. them. I think mm -hmm. it's it's a very collectible <laughs> item anyway. So it's about this about the memory of the thing. It, it it's it's create it's creating a a kind of a factor in the room in the communication between people, and that's how you introduce poems and poetry. I think this has a lot of, um, let's say, it's a public poet. It's a public a poetic notion, and I work with this. I work with letters. I work with uh, um, s s sequence of um, of meaning and send it out, like Les Fleurs du Mal, you know, mm -hmm. the Flowers of the Evil by Charles Baudelaire, because he was banned in the 19th century. So it, it everything comes with a big story, and you can present it through one little thing, and then it's out there. I put this on a mayor's office. <laughs> Can you imagine that they, after 30 months, decided to keep it yeah, that's forever? Yeah. I think you asked me about changing society. I would never say, I'm a political artist, I want to change the world. No, let's work and see how things can be different as we started before. Well, it sounds like you're just more about, you're working on the people level of just sort of um, activating people and people's perceptions and thoughts and interaction with the environment it's 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 which is a political act in a way but um it's yeah. just making people look at things in new ways it doesn't I say suppose. i'm re representing this party or government right. you're whatever, not yeah. writing you know it's not a it's not a placard that's you know yes. gets with your scree written on it or whatever um so do you do you ever sell works of art in fact um you did have a gallery at one point um oh this changed Oh, okay. <laughs> Just recently. Oh, okay. But it's interesting. The gallery here was uh, who was approaching me is uh, Daniel Mazzona in Berlin, and um, he is the son of Edigio Mazzona, one of the largest uh, conceptual art collectors, in, uh, at least in Europe. And he has 1.2 million objects and um, uh, items in his collections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's big. And uh, the son, he did his PhD on conceptual art, and I'm very pleased that we both decided to collaborate, which is going to happen in June. We do the first show now in June, which is going to be a performance show in the empty gallery and the empty streets where the gallery is located. Actually, close neighborhood to the Jewish Museum anyway. Okay. So it's very, it's very, um, very short distance. Now, I think the question is, what is the gallery? I mean, the gallery for me today is a hub to provide um, ideas. And I think conceptual artists and, and a gallery representing conceptual um, uh, artists is just, it's a, it's a, it's ma it makes a lot of sense because you have to negotiate, you have to talk to collectors in a completely different way. As I said, they become owner. The ownership is extensively more oriented in, not in the object they are gonna possess, but in the project and the process. So someone, um, a, a collector who really collects, co um, just wants to be part of the project in, in essence. And what is the impetus for them, Can, you know, do you think exactly? Uh, they are interested in the, let's say, non-objective, um, or non-object-based uh, relationship to the world. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, a, a kind of a paradigmal, paradigmatical change that people turn out to give more attention to objects than to relationships. And I think what 
Now the trading fact. Well, the change is the ob from objects to relationships. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I think this is a, is a kind of a value. Um, it's a change of values, and I think this is part of the program I'm interested in. And this is like what I said: if people are reading poems in the street, it's not that you don't ask them, "Oh, how you can make money out of it," but it's it's turning out that it is important because it's creating an atmosphere, a sphere where things can happen. You know, if you would ask, "How? Why? Why is Google or or um, Apple so successful as a company?" It's because they are. They're, they have a mastermind about creation and atmosphere. It's not that there is a mono, mono causal link. From mm -hmm. this, you have to, like great coffee, will will lead you to a great idea. But it's maybe a great coffee and a good donut and a nice conversation and an interesting wallpaper and a smell in the room and a nice view and so on and so on. That creates this rearm, mm -hmm. and inside this rearm, you are producing something. But vice versa, it's also true. If we putting people in an environment which doesn't work, let's call it school, for instance, where we are treat our our next generation just repeating results from the generation beforehand, I think this is not going to work out. So it's also about creation of an environment to provide knowledge and to develop knowledge, to criticize knowledge, and to create it on a on a greater meaning. I think this is something I'm interested in. So I work with children. Adolescent uh, uh, kids and also with adults in, on different level, and I work also with an unknown audience in public space, and I'm prepared for the unknown and unexpected. So, what is the collector part of it? So, the collector is standing behind me or maybe next to me, and we do it together. So, they may buy one or two of those photographs coming alongside with the research I have been doing. So, working about light and shadow, talking about. Uh, Plato's Cave Allegory, which is the seventh book of Politeia. Why we don't question what is the secret behind this dialogue between um, uh, Socrates and Glaucon? The, the secret is that it is media politics. We are, <laughs> we are looking at people in a cave and the people looking on the shadows and they believe these are the objects. Also some little bit cling clang in the back, there, you know, there's a sound component transmitted by that. And it's the seventh book of Politeia where Plato speaks about the constitution of state. Hmm. He speaks about the Senate, the role of the philosophers. He kind of uh, minimized the aspects of the artist in that time. You know, he was a big art hater. But it, for me, it was a very interesting point to pick out this subject, work on this, and work together with 20 philosophers worldwide and share their different perspectives. You look on French, Greek, German philosophy, from New Zealand or Japan in a different way, like a person from the US. So I was collecting all these different perspectives and compiled it in a publication. That's my daily practice. Mm -hmm. I try to connect. Now currently I'm working on resonance. So I spoke to uh, W.J.T. Mitchell uh, in, in Chicago and also to Richard Sennett about the project. So they all contribute from different directions to an idea which is incorporating the question between architecture, Holocaust, Shoah, memory, and the current times. It's a conclusion which is not made up finally, but it is in progress. And everyone who is involved knows this is on the way. It's not about finishing. It's not about it's more like you're closing a, it. Right? It's not, they don't really own anything. It's more like they're supporting it or they're, yes. they're um, uh, what's the word? I, I don't really know. Um, this is different. It's they don't have an object. It's it's yes. an unusual aspect of things. It's it's more like they're supporting a process or a. It's like research. Event. I mean, it's, it's sort of like research. It's yeah. If it's you get funding, it's a bit of funding. Yeah. 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 This this um, the collectors I work with for a long time now. Um, they are constantly uh, supporting the this this uh, kind of idea. It's, they are interested in the research. They're interested in the steps between be, before it turns out to be a show or a project which turns out to be public mm -hmm. or whatever. And they're also interested to support these kind of publications. So this publication, for instance, is very interesting because it's a book, but at the same time it was published to be presented for free as a free copy in public. Mm -hmm. Because the next problem is if you do a publication, you have to hit at least two targets. This audience you know, has to go to a bookstore or to the museum. What, uh, what is about the audience who never go to a bookstore and will never turn out onto your museum doors. So I, I try to approach them and touch them in public space. So I put stacks of these publications in public space and communicate it and people take it away. So it's about distributing ideas, 
to an unknown, unspecific audience. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, I mean, how much do people come back to you and talk to you about the event? So these people who participated over the years, you're still in touch with all of them. Well, how do you manage that, actually? That's one question. If you have... <laughs> if you've been Four hours sleep. Yeah. That's it. Oh, yes. And, okay. you, and you run 12 miles a day. Yes. No, no, 12K. 12K. 12, 12K. It's a little less, yeah. <laughs> That's less. Yes. <laughs> you have lots of energy. <laughs> um, you had a... Um, a rejected proposal on the Karl Marx at the Karl Marx Kopf in Chemnitz. Yes. Jenny Holzer, Lawrence Wiener, Wiener, in 1988. What happened there? And you know, does that happen often? Did you know that you come up with an idea and the city, the municipality says, mm -hmm. you know? Actually, I would quote Vanessa Jo Miller. She was um, she was a, uh, the editor of this publication, Public Preposition. She said every project you did research on is a project. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter if it has been realized or has been mm -hmm. rejected or mm -hmm. putting on hold or whatever. I guess Christo thinks that way or did I think, think that so. way. I think so. Yes, yeah. I was following one of his very interesting lectures the other day, and I think he's he's a little bit of he have to be very very um, consistently um, interested in the con continuity of the of a debate. I mean, he was waiting for the Rept Reichstag, I think, for almost forty years to yeah. make it happen. Yeah. So, um, getting back to your question, I think there is this. Um, there's this notion where you have to kind of, you have to be sure that you are going to initiate a, a debate anyway if it's going to lead into the realization of the project or not. So now, I mean, in 1998, to work on the, on the head, on the, on the boost, uh, the bust of uh, Karl Marx, which was actually a present by the uh, Soviet Union in that time, to change Chemnitz into Karl Marxstadt, that's why this this head has been introduced to a public space, which was embedded into a very um, uh, kind of post-socialist um, architecture in that time, is now seen in a different way. Because now we know Chemnitz, even the New York Times was, was reporting about that last year, they were chasing after people coming from different countries. So there was a big riot in the street by the right-wingish AFD uh, alternative for Germany, but it says AFD as Alternative für Deutschland. That's where the acronym comes from. So anyway, so this now the city is confronted with the socialistic vision and utopia, and with the reality. And the reality is poverty, right wingish dominance in the streets. Um, um, there is this um, uh, xenophobia, and there is this. Um, this very um, inefficient political system which cannot deal with that kind of extreme notions in the society. And when we were invited, Jenny Holzer, Lawrence Wiener and myself, we were asked to propose a piece mm -hmm. for this. And my idea was to lift the head and turn the direction from straight forward to the city into the east where, where he came from. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of, you know, like you, 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 you get off center, you, you, you know, this is a little notion and I would maybe also have used some light sources, but then the whole project had been stopped. Mm -hmm. So I don't even know the proposals by Jenny and uh, Lawrence at mm. that time. I do collab do collaborations with Lawrence sometimes, so there is this uh, exchange of ideas, but we never spoke about, about that project. About that project? No. Um, what would you say your most successful intervention or piece has, has, has been, or I guess your, what's your favorite one that you've done? <laughs> or any of the above, oh, <laughs> something oh, along those lines. Oh, oh. Um, well, hmm. well, it's hard to say, but I, I think there, there are two. There are maybe two projects. Uh, one is not is still on. This is the, uh, the resonant, resonant, the resonant project. I think this is grabbing, well, involving talk a so bit about many resonant. people. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow! Mm -hmm. It's well, it's the this first Liebeskind building. He, he, he it's his first design. Then it actually is the first building he established himself in two thousand one. And then after nine eleven, the whole security issue turned out that it has to be fenced and fenced around, so the park was not public anymore, but you have to go this through security. This is the security. Jewish Museum in Berlin. Exactly, the Jewish Museum in Berlin, which is in Kreuzberg, and Kreuzberg, uh, Berlin Kreuzberg is very much known for its Muslim limic population. Um, there's a lot of, um, let's say, low-income people, lots of unemployment rate. The unemployment rate is like double finger for minimum, at least. And then this this uh, museum was like, a, like an alien, you know, coming to that you know, as, as the architectural design comes like an alien to the environment, oh, mm -hmm. to, to the neighborhood. And then I was invited uh, two years ago in June to visit the site and then I got a carte blanche. 
I was like, wow. I mean, what a, I mean, what a, what a, what a, what a burden. First place, <laughs> what a burden. This architecture is so strong, and what can you do with it? And the first thing I did, I emptied everything. I took everything out. I made it completely naked. At the museum? Back to the, I mean, that part of the museum, mm -hmm. not the whole museum. <laughs> And the part I got was including three voids. Mm -hmm. The voids are 24 meters high, a hollows out of concrete. And they really, they really, for most of the people going there, this is, I think, the most impressive. Mm -hmm. And I tell you the truth, they were, the, the collection, the permanent collection wasn't on show for two, two years. And the visitors rate was just minus 2%. Mm. So people just come. Mm -hmm. Just come to see the architecture. Nine hundred to one million people a year. Yeah. So it's really it's 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 a it's a must see point on your list um, if you visit uh, Berlin. This is one thing. But the the other reality is that to work as a contemporary artist, being not Jewish in that context, everything you do turns out to be connected to the original um, initiative of that museum. But uh, from the very, very first beginning, I got very positive feedback by Daniel um, Liebeskind and his wife, Nina. And so there was a family back up there, and the curators got Gregor Lersch, uh, who was coming today, actually, to town. We are just started a conversation. We made, I worked on two kind of master plans, kind of mind maps inside the museum and outside the museum, connecting different sites in the city with the museum, doing performances, inserts involving 250 musicians. And you know, as a curator, you want to have a control mm -hmm. stick in your hand. Right. And they signed a contract saying every mu musical contribution has to enter the museum and there is no censorship. And ha those musical contributions to that piece come via the internet and then they're played? Yes. And uh, uh, Is that limited now? Is there a No, it's not limited. You still you can, can send still it in, but we need to... You can still a 60-minute musical contribution to your piece. 60 seconds, I'm sorry. 60, 60 seconds, sorry. Yes, yes, I said no. 60 minutes, yeah. I'm not encouraging any <laughs> of the composers to send in 60 minutes composition. <laughs> would we be great, but uh, 60 seconds would, would, would be great either. But uh, So they, they are 60 seconds of sound, which is turning like a wheel in the museum hollow, in these voids, okay. together with the lights, which are also changing. And then at the same time, the, the sound is also projected. Okay. Yeah, you feel it physically. And then there's a 30 seconds break, and then another 60 second and a 30 second break. So there's a little bit of a routine in it, like a, like a, a systematic. At the same time, it's completely open to from uh, vocal sound to electronic music to classical to radical to 60 seconds smash glass by John Thorne. So the, everything included. What do you mean it's open to that? Because um, you mean the pieces that are played are those things that you just listed? Okay, yes. so, but, so when you walk in, you don't know which piece is going to be played, obviously. Is it on a random? It's on a random pattern, but there is a little bit of, a, there is a little bit of an information provided on a small screen, just a, you know, oh, half like of this. Oh, like what's playing now? Yes, so that people get, could get an orientation and information if they want, but they just could just, just appreciate Just go in and experience yes. the light and it's the It's a sound. light walk-in. They call it a walk-in light and sound installation. Okay. So that's interesting because you need to move mm -hmm. to explore the whole uh, secret of it. it it's, a, it's a sequenced and programmed choreography, mm -hmm. which as a visitor you don't see in the first place. You mm -hmm. just go, go in there, maybe there's a little bit dark, there's a, some red light in the end, and there's a shadow there. And a, and a mirror there, so it's, you know, and then if you tour it around for some time, after 10, 15 minutes, it's starting to, it's helping for your understanding to spend some time there. And do, do people um, contribute musically to it after they've been there, or is it people who from the outside who've heard about it and contribute, or is it both, or what are you finding? Who's I think contributing? We, as we started to work on this, um, for the, f to initiate the whole process, we worked with an open call and we worked by invitation. So the invitation thing, that was the first phase as we started in November 2017. We wanted to have the first artist to be audible mm -hmm. in the space. So uh, the first artist I approached was John Zorn in New York. John Zorn probably didn't <laughs> so <here's Kristallnacht>. randomly. <laughs> no, no, Kristallnacht is a, it's a 60 m minutes piece of broken glass. Just broken glass. It's it's terrible to listen to, but it's so important that this piece exists. Okay, so he was giving us a sixty-second extract, mm -hmm. okay. and he his note his note says play it loud. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> I, I admire his uh, radical approach. Anyway, so he he was re responding after three minutes. I was sending his an email, and I received his uh, um, um, 
interest in three minutes. So it was like, okay, wow, that's fast. So we approached, we is a team of people who know, have access to the music world. So then we got contribution from Tehran, we got contribution from the US, we got from India, from, um, from various places in the world. I, I never counted the countries, but I would say around 75 or 80 countries in the world. They were just sending in the, and the different cultural backgrounds and there was an interview, some two people talking. And I mean, this, the complexity is interesting. And this is all in one vessel. I mean, the, 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 the voids turn out to be a vessel for those many voices. And I think this is a strong reference to what, when we say the Jewish uh, society has been erased through the genocide, um, genocide by the German Nazi regime in that period of time, all, we also erased all these voices, the complexity of cultures, because the people with the Jewish faith came from various countries and brought in various cultures mm -hmm. alongside their faith. Mm. So I think this turns out to be very, um, let's say, associated to the content of the museum. As you know that when the museum was open as the architecture without collection, they had 350,000 visitors in three months. Mm -hmm. So people were just interested to see the empty architecture. And there is this little quote I found on Dan, from Daniel Liebeskin, as he said, just keep the museum like that. Just keep the museum <laughs> as the museum, as the architecture, yeah. and don't put anything in it. Well, the piece is the... What so you're empty vitrines. Is, yeah. And now I work with the empty vitrines and the empty space, yeah. and I double it with light and mirrors and connect it with the people. So the audience become actors. Mm -hmm. It's... I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitating saying it's a selfie spot because selfie has a so-called kind of a rubbish cultural connotation yeah. as we look at it from uh, well, about portrait and self-portrait, whatever. You have this little badge of Rembrandt, which is a self-portrait by himself. So it is about the way we look on us in a certain time. But if we look on us in the context of the shore and then in the context of the Jewish Museum in Berlin, inside the resonant, it turns out to be as a okay moment to deliver the status quo, where I am, who I am in that particular moment, in that installation. So we provide a hashtag, GMB resonant, and so online people are uploading their experience on that hashtag. And it turns out to a little bit that social media is a benefit to the project because we need people to speak loudly about it, to protect it. Silent doesn't help. So that was the reason when 94, the second mm -hmm. impressive, or not impressive, but the second important project I did in my life was to work on this uh, synagogue in Stommel because it is small. Mm -hmm. It's a very um, rural area, very small neighborhood, just 8,000 people in a small village, but it was growing mm -hmm. through the political and social discourse mm -hmm. and the dissonance to the society mm -hmm. and the disagreement on that this is part of our society mm -hmm. because there was still this notion, yes, we want to separate from foreign people, separate from Jewish uh, faith and to become a more Christian united um, uh, population or um, society. So I think this was also interesting that because the light was saying we are here mm -hmm. as another synagogue which has been rebuilt in mm -hmm. Essen, in a bigger town, right. was putting itself into dark. And right. then the, the, there were three Palestinian guys who smashed the windows mm -hmm. because it was dark. Mm -hmm. And because of the limelight, it becomes so strongly visible that the presence of light also creates a kind of a, a security uh, oh. factor around right. it. Mm -hmm. yeah? So it's kind of an ambivalence uh -huh. in notion. Yeah. Um, how do the curators feel? Feel, you told them that they couldn't have any control over this. I, I, they, I imagine that they're happy with the result, but I mean, what, what is your... Well, it was a starting a debate inside the museum, and I think this is also the secret of resonant, that it is, for us, it's a process. Everything I say now, it's in the middle of doing it, so it's still running till yeah. this September 1st, and we're still collecting feedback, we're still collecting essays, we're still working on the catalog and documentation. We just had a, a women's uh, electronic music collective working there for um, for four hours, for two days each, and then just you know experimenting with the sound in that uh, uh, environment. And so we are still you know 
in the, yeah. in the, in the digesting phase, mm -hmm. one, one could say. But what I can say till now is that I think the museum and the curator had developed together as a we. We formulated a team on time and we are just still working on it. And it was not about, I'm going there, just this, this, this and that. And they just agreed and signed it. No, it is about, let's, can you think about that? How we can do this and that? And so we were taking, listening to each other and developing it because it's so sensitive to work in that architecture and on that specific subject matter. Okay, now Samantha has a question for you. Um, do you collect anything yourself? Anything? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Any actual that's crucial. objects or? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, we are just in the phase of, actually, I started to, to become interested uh, into arts when I was 12. And um, then 16, I think I decided to, be, to work as an artist. And I think I was 17, 18 when I did my first uh, public performances. Uh, I was very much in, influenced by Joseph Beuys. I met him three times in my life. I mean, in three different phases of my life. I've met him much more earlier, but um, I was a laundry delivery boy as a job. <laughs> he was one of my clients I've seen him met plenty of times. And he was a very good advisor. He was very strict and also charming and uh, kind of a father type of uh, person. And then um, I knew him when he was an activist. Then I was 10 years old. I was distributing his pamphlets for just a small pocket money, which was great too. I would, I would, I thought I should have kept some of those pamphlets. I think there would worse <laughs> be something. But it was this moment in time. I was just part of a performance. He was uh, uh, delegating to some people, and I was just part of the of that group. And he was a godfather of the of one of the buildings I have been squattering. Oh. He was a protector. When he was in public, people were not thinking of taking those squatters out of the building. Oh, okay. Because he was so prominent and his, his face in media was bad news for the owners of the building if they had been accused uh, to take out the people living there on a temporary basis. So I think um, that was a good starting point. And I also, we would just have little of Joseph Boyce in our collection, but there are some, some of his objects he had been doing to perform political issues into public. Mm -hmm. So it's called, one piece is called Zwei Parteienstadt, which is a plastic bag with a lot of material in it. The other one is a, a print, two prints of a charcoal. He was like a little bit like Rudolf Steiner when he was uh, explaining it to the world. <laughs> so it has this ephemeral component because one it could be erased it easily, but it's printed now, so it's safe. And some other of those objects. And uh, we have a collection of uh, contemporary photography, which is actually Michelle's uh, section, my wife's section so far. And we didn't really count them, but till recently, uh, Claudia, our assistant, she uh, was kind of insisting, said, we need to make a digital, you know, make sure that everything is listed now. And I think we we stopped counting after 800 pieces. So, oh, in fact, you do have in a fact <laughs> and also because of the twins, we, we sometimes purchase two works of one artist to give it, if they leave home soon, <laughs> they will have a small, they can start with a little collection. So, I'm interested actually in books. We have some thousand books. Uh, we have our own library for this, you know, and I think I have a very object related uh, um, habit if it comes to collection. But I'm also collecting, um, just say, notes um, from um, Lawrence Wiener to execute a work, which is, you know, the very conceptual um, axis, or there are other artists, they work at the same area, like Stephen Villets, a British artist who works in, in social environment, and um, Joseph Koshud. So we have a little bit of a conceptual artist, Hannah Daboven. And so, you do that yeah. because you get them through your contact, your personal contact with these artists, you don't go out and search them out and buy them or, or so much? Well, actually, the two recent uh, most recent acquisitions turn out to be um, very um, propagandist, mm -hmm. propagandist artists uh, in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, for instance, they were doing designing posters, mm -hmm. uh, including Sister Corita, um, uh, Rachel Kent, the, uh, the artist who was a part of the protests in Berkeley in 1967. Okay. You still can buy her posters for less than $25. And I think there is no art market interest in her. Mm -hmm. But this is, she did children books and she was doing a protest uh, um, posters. Hmm. And I think there is, a, I'm very interested in her because she has this background and she could easily be working in the studio um, of Andy Warhol in that time. Interesting. Because she had the same aesthetics. 
Mm. If you don't, if you're not familiar with her, you should mm, look her yeah, up. Yeah. Sister Corita, Berkeley, okay. 1967. And still, it's uh, the estate still sells the material. The books are difficult to find, but the books are great too. Okay. Very interesting approach to that medium. And um, and I bought uh, the one piece is called Protest, okay. just the, the English word protest, and the other one is called Profit. Okay. So this is about, very, it's very, very propagandish kind of fish, and it goes back to um, Macunia's, um, well, this is a very tough American flag out of uh, notions from uh, genocide and um, 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 acid-based um, attacks, sulfid, but I mean, I cannot ex uh, explain it to you, it's from 1972. And there's artworks in the American um, artwork like uh, Kent State by mm -hmm. Richard Hamilton from 1972. So I have a Myself, I have a very specific interest in, in artworks, and if I find it through auctions or someone sent me an information, I try to find it. But we have very limited budget, honestly. Okay. I'm financially not very successful. <laughs> <laughs> so, are there other things you'd like to discuss that I haven't covered? No, I'm, I'm very pleased. I'm, you started with the introduction. I had no time to respond to that introduction. I'm very pleased to be an honor to... I think we create a moment uh, in terms of discussion, and this moment is documented and it's it's um, accessible to the audience. But it's still the moment we have now today. But I think this um, this attempt that the Frick Collection takes this as the Frick Collection has very physical the building, the collection <laughs> itself, and then takes a mission in that uh, uncollectible or let's say in a, in, in parentheses uncollectible. Um, area, I think it's very interesting because we didn't touch the uh, land art. I mean, land art has hmm. own strategies of production, mm -hmm. and I think that the light tram, the ghost tram, is a little bit of a land art piece, but in not in a, in a rural area, but or in the desert, like Michael Heiser or Robert Smithson did, but um, or Nancy Holt. But uh, I think these these artists were so brave in that time because media, as we know it today, doesn't exist. So it was not making a photo and just spread it all over the world. It was visible to millions of you know spectators in a way, not being at, uh, at the site specifically. But they were interested in that people move from their uh, home bases and their environment to see that, ex to experience that. But I think also in the moment of creation, when I was looking at the Smithson uh, documentation on Spyro Jetty, I found there was this moment that it was about the creation itself, mm -hmm. to be in that dialogue between heaven and earth, between land and water. I think this piece embodies so much of this, let's say, almost spiritual, archaic, mm -hmm. even the form itself, the spiral, mm -hmm. you know, um, goes back to a lot of um, archaic uh, um, connotations. And I think... It's, it's good that the Frick Collection is taking on this mission. So I'm just a little <laughs> bit over speaking, uh, talking head in that. Uh, we are talking heads in no, that. No, no, no. Yeah, it's, very, yeah, it's uh, good debate, to bring, you know? tie it back to the symposium since this is an interview connected with that. But we're also just interested in, in you as an artist. And we, we had as an element, more of the light element in there, in the in collectible. Um, but we moved towards the earth. So yes. Specific, um, just for various. Maybe there's a follow up, and we we can focus Maybe and emphasize can, on that. Yeah. <laughs> or do an intervention anyway. So I would, yeah, would be interested in that collection. Uh, so. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you Someday. so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. <laughs> Lovely to talk with you. Likewise.